Today we're in Ezekiel chapters 9 and 10. At least I hope we are. We're in chapter 9 for sure. And um, I'm going to just touch on some things. I'm going to do my best to, uh, to be able to cover both of those chapters. So let's begin together here in Ezekiel chapter 9. I'll read beginning at verse 1, reading verses 1 through 4, and we'll get into our study here. Ezekiel chapter 9, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. Ezekiel writes, Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's ink horn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now, the glory of, of the God of Israel had gone up from the, from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's ink horn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. Now, as we've been going through Ezekiel, and we were in chapter 8 last time, we saw that God has determined to bring judgment on Jerusalem as well as all Israel. In chapter 8, verse 18, the last verse of chapter 8, we had read, uh, I also will act in fury, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity, and though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. God is determined to bring judgment on the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel has determined to remain in sin. And even though they're going to cry out when the judgment comes, God says, I will not listen to them. The psalmist in Psalm 66, verse 18, said it this way. He said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Their sin is making a separation between them and God. Their desire to retain their iniquity, their desire to retain their sin, their lack of repentance, their unwillingness to turn loose of their idolatry is going to produce in, in, in God a response of judgment that isn't going to be held back at all. The Bible tells us that, that sin makes a separation. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. And so these are those who will be crying out when they're being judged, but God says, I'm not going to spare you. My eye will not spare you. We know that idolatry defiled the land. And as a result, as we were looking at this in chapter 8, that idolatry has filled that land, the land of Israel, with impurity as well as violence. And, and, and God wanted to know, and we saw as he asked this in chapter 8, do you consider this a trivial thing? Do you think this is small? In other words, have you come to the idea that sin is no big deal? There's no problem with it. Do you have this mentality, he could be speaking to them, concerning the fact that they're idolaters? Do you have this, this belief that religion is religion? It's all the same. It really doesn't matter. Now, we need to remember that that which made Israel unique and that which made Israel unique in its day, as well as that which originally made the United States unique in the entire world, was the fact that it had a relationship that was open, a relationship with God. The nation of Israel had a covenant relationship with God. Even our nation, in its inception, had an open acknowledgement of our need for, for God. There's a French historian that people like to quote. His name is de Tocqueville. He lived from 1805 to 1859, and, and it's been reported that he said, the Americans combine the notions of religion and liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive of one without the other. And so the religious underpinnings of our nation were so well known that French philosophers and historians would actually observe that and write about it and declare it to be a fact that the nation of the United States had its religious beliefs entwined with its political system. That which drove our system was our religious beliefs. It's interesting, he also said this. I'm just throwing this in because I found this interesting. De Tocqueville said, the American Republic will endure until the day Congress discovers that it can bribe the public with the public's money. 
That's an interesting thing. So I just threw that out. Think about it. Here's something for you. Can, it's a question. Can a religious faith produce a culture of sexual immorality and violence? Can a religious faith produce a culture of sexual immorality and violence? Can that be the culture of the nation? And can that culture of the nation be derived from religious beliefs and principles? And the answer is quite obviously yes. You can see that in various places in the world. I've seen that very specifically in the nation of India. Very specifically seen that in India. There is a culture of violence that came from religious underpinnings in India. Uh, you, there, are, there are Christians who are, are being martyred for their faith in India on a regular basis, especially in the north, northern India. I was getting my hair cut yesterday, and there was a, a lady, an Indian lady, who was returning to Bombay, and she was getting her hair dyed as she was in the seat next to me, and I was getting a perm. No, she was seating there <laughs> next to me. And, and she was just talking about India and all, and, and um, she said, you know, there are two things that you should never speak about. Now, she was telling this to the lady who was doing her hair. She said, you should never talk about politics, and you should never talk about religion. And, um, and I'm just seated there next to her, and... Um, I'm not saying anything. I didn't say anything. I just kind of sat there quietly. And, um, and she was kind of giving her opinions on various things and all. And, and um, the, the, the brother who, who cuts my hair uh, goes to our fellowship, and I've known him for 25 years. And uh, so I go there and actually spend time with him and talk about the Lord and minister to him and have fellowship with him every time I get my hair cut. And so it's just that's what we do. And so... You know, I waited, and she got up, and she walked out. I didn't want to start a fight. <laughs> and uh, I told the lady, uh, who I happen to know and have known for a long time also, I, who was doing her hair, I said, you know, he said, the fact is, is that India is in the state that it is in today because of its religious beliefs. It, it, I said, I've been to India on two occasions. I've, I, I've spent, you know, uh, almost a total of a month in India, and, and, and I've seen it from from the north to the, to the east, to the south, to the west. I, I've flown from, you know, Bombay and to Delhi, to Madras, to, to Vandroom. I've been around it. And I've seen the effect of the religion of India, I said. And, and um, the nation of India has become what it is because of its religious beliefs. And I began to share some very basic things with her that I've shared with this church on a number of occasions. I said there's a lot of poverty and there's a lot of starvation that is in India right now, but did you know that, that rats eat enough grain per year to fill boxcars that would be filled with grain that would be able to stretch from Los Angeles all the way to New York? That's how much grain is eaten by rats, that you can go into a Hindu temple as I have done, and on the outside of the temple there'll be children who are seven, eight, nine years of age begging for food, and the people who are walking in to make offerings to rat gods because they're feeding rats. They'll walk past these children who are starving and take their grain and give it to the rats. Did you know that? I said, and I started sharing some things. I said, there's so many things that Americans think we think romantically about India as if it's a beautiful nation and all. And it's not to say that the people are not, are not beautiful people. Indeed, you know, God loves them and they're very, they've been very kind to us. But at the same time, the, the religion of India has made India what it is. There are kids, and I, uh, she said, well, you know this, this movie, did you see something, Slumdog Millionaire? I said, no, I haven't seen that. Um, she said, well, she said, it shows so many things about India. I said, well, do you know that there are men who take children and they will, they will maim those children? They'll cut their hands off, they'll break their fingers so that they're, they're, they don't heal properly and those children are used? Uh, to, to beg. She said, well, that was in the movie, that kind of thing where they blind the children. I said, those things are real. That really takes place. I said, I have a, a man that I know. His name is Moses Paulos. Moses Paulos is a pastor, and he and his son, I met them when I went to India the very first time I ever went. And he's an evangelist. And Moses and his son had gotten a word that a certain small village wanted to hear the gospel, and so Moses took his son and several other evangelists to go into the city in order that they might preach the gospel, but it was a trap. And when they got there, the people of the city were waiting for them, took them, tied them to an old tree, the oldest tree in the, in the village, 
and beat them with rods until they were unconscious and almost dead. They sent for the village skinner. They have somebody who's there who actually will peel your skin off with a knife. They sent for him so they could be skinned alive. But he was somewhere else, and so God mercifully spared them from that torture. They left them there at the tree. They were able to be taken to a hospital. Moses was hospitalized for some time. He and his son were beaten to the point where they almost didn't recover. And after Moses had, had recovered, he went back to that village, and he took his son. And they went back in because he said, I know God wants me to preach the gospel here. And when he went in, the village, village elders were waiting for him. And when, they walked, when he came into the village, they rushed up to him and they said, we've been waiting for you to come back because we know we offended your God and we need to know what to do in order to make it right with him. And he says, how did you come to that conclusion? They took him to the tree that he had been tied to. It was the oldest tree. It was a place where they do their sacrifices and their idol worship, and the tree was dead. And they said, your God is angry at us, and we need to know how to satisfy his anger. And that's when he was able to plant a church there. And I began to tell a story after story after story of the nation of India, a nation that is in its condition because of its religious system. Yes, religion does bring down a nation or it can exalt a nation. A right relationship with God will produce a, a nation that is blessed, but a nation that is given over to idolatry is a nation that ultimately is judged by God. And the nation of Israel is a nation that is being judged by God here in Ezekiel chapter 9 because God has been saying to them, you have given yourself over to idolatry. And as a result of that, I will deal with you. God is going to judge them. Now, in verses 1 and 2, it says, uh, he, he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen, had a rider's ink horn at his side, they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. So God is preparing to bring judgment, the judgment he's been declaring on this nation. And so it speaks concerning the fact that he called out. He called out in my hearing with a loud voice. This loud voice reveals his displeasure. And what God is doing is he's summoning six angelic executioners. They come from the north, which is the direction that Babylon is going to come as she brings her armies in opposition to the nation. Verse 2 says that they stood before the bronze altar. This would be an altar of sacrifice. And as they stand there, there's an angel that is clothed in linen. Now, when it says this angel is clothed in linen, that's a garment of distinction. And so he's carrying a rider's ink horn, which would be a pot holding the rider's ink. And there he is standing there with his rider's ink horn. And it says in verse 3, Now the glory of the, of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the uh, man clothed with linen who had the rider's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. So God is beginning now in stages, and you're going to be seeing this into chapter 11. He's beginning in stages to remove his glory. He's beginning to remove his glory from the temple. The glory of God resides in the most holy place between the wings of the cherubim, there on the mercy seat. And it begins to depart. And this is a picture of the slow departure of God's glory from that temple. Here we see that it, it begins to leave to the front door, to that threshold. Later in chapter 10, we'll see it goes to the east gate. And then in chapter 11, it, it departs from the Mount of Olives. And we'll see that in stages as we go through these chapters together. But the glory of the Lord is beginning to depart. In verse 4, the Lord says, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. And he says, and Place a mark on them. Place a mark on these people. And the ones that, that he's marking are the ones who, and I want you to see this, the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. You're going to specially mark out those who are mourning over the sin of the city. Not everybody, in other words, has given, over, given themselves over to the sinfulness of, of uh, what the rest of the nation has given itself over to. God's going to bring judgment, but what he does, as he's removing his presence from the temple, he protects those who worship him. God does that. God brings judgment, and you see this throughout the Bible. He brings judgment, but he protects those who, who are right with him. In, uh, in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, 
In chapter 18, God had been speaking to Abram and had said to him that he was going to bring judgment on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the smaller cities that surrounded them there, and that he's going to bring judgment. And as, as he's speaking this to Abram, Abram begins to speak to him in return, and it says in Genesis 18, 25, Abram speaking to God, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So he knew something about God. He knew that God would not slay the, the righteous with the wicked, which is what's taking place here in the book of Ezekiel. God has a pattern of delivering those who are covered by him. And think of the, the time when, when um, the children of Israel were in Egyptian bondage and it's now Passover and how God has said that he's going to care for those who, who put the blood over the lintels, over the doorposts of their houses, and those who were covered by that, the, the angel of death would pass over them and leave them alive. So God does that, and you see that in the Old Testament. You also see the same kind of thing in the New. If you take note, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God knows those who are His, and God's wrath doesn't fall on those whom He has set apart for Himself. This kind of selection of those who are righteous and keeping them during a time of judgment is seen all the way into the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 7, in the last days during the tribulation, in verses 2 and 4, says, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, and the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And so God has a way of marking those who are His, keeping them and protecting them even in the midst of judgment. Now some, by the way, I'll just make a real quick comment on this. Some commentators believe that this one who is there with the ink horn that we're looking at is actually a pre-incarnation of Jesus Christ. And he's enacting mercy and compassion, which is what Jesus Christ does. Now, in verse 5, to the others he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Judgment begins, and it is thorough and it is complete. But I want you to see this. It begins at the temple. Judgment began at the temple, and the first ones being judged were those apostate elders that we saw last time we were looking at, at Ezekiel in chapter 8. Why would they be the first to be judged? The reason they were the first to be judged is because they had the greatest responsibility because they had the most knowledge. They were aware of the things of the Lord. They were aware of the things of God. They were supposed to be protectors of the things of the Lord. And therefore, they had the greatest responsibility because they had the greatest knowledge. And so God brought judgment on them. There's an interesting scripture, it's found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, that tells us judgment begins in the house of God. And if it begins first with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Judgment begins in the house of God. God begins to clean house, and first begins with those who profess to know the Lord. One of the things that I find interesting is when you begin to study through the Gospels and all, and you get to Matthew in chapter 13, you begin to see that Jesus has a, a variety of, of, um, of parables that he gives there, and he speaks concerning wheat, and he speaks concerning tares, and, and he speaks concerning the fact that, that the tares actually grow up amongst the wheat. And you begin to see that there's going to be in the last days the existing church, which is typified by wheat, but there's going to be amongst the wheat that which is counterfeit or actually looks like wheat, but in reality, it's called darnel. It has the appearance of wheat, but you don't know that it isn't 
wheat until it comes to full maturity. And in the church to this day, and I believe that we're in the last day, so I think this applies to the church, especially in our days, churches can be filled with people, filled with people. I mean, numbers and numbers and thousands of people. You can have some enormous gatherings of people. It's not really that difficult to get gatherings of people. There are certain things that have to take place, but you can have thousands of people show up for various things. But just because you have a lot of people doesn't mean that you have the church because the church is typified in Scripture as a little flock. It's a small amount amongst the larger. And so what takes place is God begins to sift through, and judgment always begins in the house of God. And so what happens here is he says, listen, I'm going to bring judgment. I want you to mark off those who are actually mourning over the circumstances and situations that you find yourself in there in the nation. Those are the people who are going to be spared because they have my heart. They care. The other ones don't care. Therefore, they're going to be judged. Every one of them will be judged. He said, not everyone, though, who has a righteous heart, those who are mourning are going to be spared in all of this as it's about to take place. And so it says... In verse 7, he said to them, Defile the temple, fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. Now, it's interesting how in verse 8 it says, So it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone, and I fell on my face and cried out and said, Ah, oh, Lord God, will you destroy all the tem remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem. And he said to me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city full of perversity. For they say the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. So he says, listen, you're going to do this. You're going to defile the temple. In verse 7, you're going to defile the temple, fill the courts with the slain because the temple has already been defiled, and under Mosaic law, a dead body is one of the most defiling things, and therefore it's going to be a picture of your idolatry. And as this is taking place, and as Ezekiel is seeing this, in verse 8, he's, he's left alone, and I want you to see what happens. He falls on his face, and he begins to cry out, and he's overwhelmed. He's seen Jerusalem, and he's seen Israel being purged of evil, and he's overwhelmed by what he sees. It may be that he's afraid that the entire nation's being wiped out before his very eyes. Imagine what we would feel if, if, if our neighborhood and, and those whom we know, perhaps you know your neighbors. It's difficult to know your neighbors today, by the way, isn't it? Some of us really don't know our neighbors. They, they're never home. My, my neighborhood is really interesting. I don't know if yours is the same. Probably is. It's interesting. There was a time when you knew your next-door neighbors and everything, you know? Uh, I really, I, I, to this day, I've been in my neighborhood for many years, and I, I, my neighbors, it seems like we never come out except to get the paper and run back in. It's kind of interesting, and it's not a real friendly group of people waving, and hi, how are you, how are the kids? We've had neighbors like that, but it, it's, it's kind of like a to-yourself kind of neighborhood and everything like that. But, but say that you know your neighbors. Say that you're part of the neighborhood watch, and you have those meetings, and you gather together, and you have cookies and tea and coffee with some of the people around that neighborhood, and you've been sharing with them and all. And, um, and you know that this person here goes to church, loves the Lord, this person over here doesn't, and all of that, and you're pretty aware of what's going on in your neighborhood. Imagine how you would feel if that neighborhood suddenly was decimated, if judgment fell on the neighbors, and you saw that. And if you had the big picture and you began to see that judgment as it's spreading out from that neighborhood throughout the city, and all of these people are being literally slaughtered. And as you see that taking place, person after person, household after household, well, that's what Ezekiel's feeling. Ezekiel sees this and he's horrified by it. And he begins to cry out. That's what he says in verse 8. Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel and point out your fury on Jerusalem? Are you going to destroy them all? Is anybody going to survive? But God says the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The sin so great that judgment can't be postponed any longer. What's interesting is, is how God reveals their hearts. Notice how it says in verse, verse 9, how it says, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city full of perversity. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord doesn't see they think that I have ignored them, that I'm not watching them. 
So their attitude is, well, if he doesn't care for us, then why should we care for him? If he doesn't love me, why should I love him? That's their attitude. And what has happened is they think they can get away with doing whatever they want. They're even blaming God for their troubles. And so since God in their minds has left them, they're stating, well, why not leave him? But he goes on to say, well, as for me also, my eye will not spare, will neither spare, nor will I have pity, but I will recompense their deeds on their own head. Just then the man clothed with linen who had the ink horn at his side reported back and said, I've done as you commanded me. My eye will neither spare nor will I have pity. I will recompense. God, and this is something we have to grab hold of right now, God waited for a long time before he brought judgment on this nation. Israel's sin was prolonged. It was deliberate. There was a willing rejection of God. They didn't care anything about God's commandments. And they had continued in that way for a long time to the point where God had to act. He had to move. He had to do something. The Bible presents to us a picture of a God who has patience and is long-suffering. He puts up with people for a long time. I don't know how old you were when you came to faith in Christ. Perhaps you were raised in a Christian home where all you've ever known is the faith of Christ, and you embraced Him as your Savior at such an early age that you can't even give a date. You just know that all your life you've, you've lived in a home that loves the Lord, and you went to Sunday school, and you received baptism when you were a young child, and you've been walking with the Lord all the days of your life and can't even pinpoint a moment. And then there are others who would say, well, no, I, I didn't have a relationship with God for some time, 20 years, 30 years. Some people get saved when they're over 30, 40 years old. A lifetime of rejecting God, a lifetime of, of deliberately not having anything to do with Him. But God, in His mercy, patiently waited for you. And you have a tremendous amount of gratitude now because you can see what you were and how loving and compassionate and patient God was, which stirs up within you a, a thankfulness and a desire to serve the Lord that comes from that understanding. I'm grateful that God was patient with me. I was only 20 years of age. When I got saved at 20, I thought I was old. Now I realized I was just a kid, and I thank God that he reached me at that age, saved me from so many things that I could have done had I continued in my sin longer than those 20 years. But God has patience, doesn't he? God waits. But his patience does come to an end. God waited a long time before he flooded the earth during the days of Noah. That flood didn't come immediately. God gave Noah a message and gave him a project. He was a preacher of righteousness, and he had the project of building that ark. And as he built the ark, he was declaring to the people as a preacher of righteousness that God is bringing judgment. And God waited, and God waited for quite some time. It says in 1 Peter in chapter 3, verse 20, the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. When the flood came, there were only eight people on the entire face of the earth that survived because when God finally said, my patience has, has reached its end, and the Bible tells us that, that Noah's family was in the ark and that God shut the door. And when that happened, the judgment came, but it demonstrated that God had tremendous patience. God has patience with you. God has patience with me. God waits, but ultimately, he gets tired of waiting, and that's what's going to happen for the nation. He wanted this nation to repent. He didn't want to judge them, and it was out of his love and his mercy that he waited until judgment was necessary. There's a great question it's found in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, uh, do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? 
Don't you understand that God doesn't smack you down the first time you sin immediately, but gives you an opportunity to come to your senses in Him so that He doesn't have to do that? Don't you understand that God doesn't strike you down but gives you opportunity because He cares and loves you? But ultimately what happens is He will deal with you, and that's what happens. And so he says, I'm not going to spare them. In verse 11, just then the man clothed with linen who had the inkhorn at his side reported back and said, I've done as you commanded me. Man clothed in linen. I've done what you've commanded me. Everything is set. But that also includes, by the way, the fact that he marked those people who were mourning over the sin of Israel. So you see the judgment of God coming, but you see again the compassion and the mercy. In chapter 10, and I looked, and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone, having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Then he spoke to the man clothed with linen and said, go in among the wheels under the cherub, fill your hands with coals of fire from among the cherubim, scatter them over the city. And he went in as I watched. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple. And the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even in the outer court like the voice of Almighty God when he speaks. Then it happened when he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, take fire from among the wheels, from among the cherubim, that he went in and stood beside the wheels. And the cherub stretched out his hand from among the cherubim to the fire that was among the cherubim and took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed with linen who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a man's hand under their wings. And so... He continues to minister and gives more insight. Ezekiel is continuing to have visions. And what he sees now is the appearance of a throne. It looks like sapphire. And God speaks to this in verse 2. He speaks to the man clothed with linen. And so the man who is clothed with linen is to go and take coals of fire, and he's to scatter them over Jerusalem. Now, these coals of fire represent judgment. Remember when God brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. It says in Genesis 19, 24, that the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord from the heavens. And so Sodom and Gomorrah was judged with fire and brimstone, and so that's the picture here. There's a judgment that is coming. Verse 3 says the cherubim were standing on the south side, and so what he sees is he sees the glory of God there. He sees what is called the Shekinah glory of God. It's described like a cloud. And the glory is hovering over the threshold of the temple. The court now is illuminated with brilliance. And what is happening, and this is a picture here in verse 3, as, as the, the cloud is filling that inner court and all. In verse 4, the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold. What we see here is really a picture that's heartbreaking, and I can't describe it in a way that's going to cause you to understand that. The glory of the Lord is about to depart from the nation of Israel, a nation that had an incredible privilege of having a relationship with the unique God of the universe, a nation of Israel that had been given prophets and vision, miracles, a nation that was given the Word of God, a nation that ultimately Messiah came through, a nation that had so many advantages. It had that temple, it had the law, it had the sacrifice. It had the glory of God. Throughout the whole world, there were temples that were scattered wherever human beings lived. But the glory of God was not found in any of those man-made temples. The glory of God was found only in the place that God chose to dwell. And that was in the temple there in the city of Jerusalem. This glory, that was a, a sign of God's presence with the nation and His pleasure with them. It's called the Shekinah glory of God. And He first dwelt amongst them when they had a portable temple called the tabernacle. And when the glory first descended, it was so awesome. 
It's recorded in, in Exodus 40, verses 34 and 35, how it says the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It was so awesome and so brilliant and so beautiful that Moses dared not even enter into that tabernacle. When they built the temple, it's found in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. It says, It came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. What an incredible, awesome thing to have the glory of God present with you. The Shekinah glory of God. Not the Chicano glory, the Shekinah glory. And that presence is about to leave. God's presence with the nation. In verses 5 through 8, he speaks of the sound of the wings of the cherubim. And, and, he, and, and you keep seeing as he speaks about this that there's fire. Notice verse 6, it says, Take fire from among the wheels, from among the cherubim. So he begins to speak using pictures to remind us that this is the judgment that is coming. And what this emphasis is, is to, to be a, a portrayal of what is about to take place. You see, when Jerusalem is, is overrun by Nebuchadnezzar's troops, the city is burned. And that's what this fire represents. Uh, it's found in 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 9, where it says that he burned the house of the Lord, the king's house. All the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. And so, this is a picture of the judgment that is about to fall on them. It's coming in fire. Now, in verse 9, when I looked, there were four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherub, another wheel by each other cherub. The wheels appeared to have the color of beryl stone. As for their appearance, all four looked alike, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went toward any of their four directions. They did not turn aside when they went, but followed in the direction the head was facing. They did not turn aside when they went. Their whole body, with their back, their hands, their wings, and the wheels that, had, the, wheels that the four had were full of eyes all around. As for the wheels... They were called in my hearing, wheel. That's kind of self-explanatory, isn't it? <laughs> Each one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face, the face of a man. The third, the face of a lion. The fourth, the face of an eagle. The cherubim were lifted up. This was the living creature I saw by the river Kivar. When the cherubim went, the wheels went beside them. When the cherubim lifted their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also did not turn from beside them. When the cherubim stood still, the wheels stood still. And when one was lifted up, the other lifted itself up, for the spirit of the living creature was in them. So basically, I can just touch this briefly. He's, he's actually reiterating what we saw in chapter 1. He sees these angelic beings called cherubim. And they're moving in the direction that God would have them to go. What this is a picture of is a picture of God's chariot as he's ready to depart. Because a cherubim are the, is that coach, if you will, that, that is carrying the Lord's glory. You'll see that in a moment. What's interesting, and I want you to see this in verse 12, how it says that the cherubim and, and the wheels were full of eyes all around. When it says that, I mean, if you get a picture of that, you, you begin to wonder, what does that really mean? It's really not difficult to understand what he's saying if you just see it as the obvious. You know, eyes obviously speak about that what you see, and so this gives us a picture of God knowing everything. It speaks of his omniscience, and it just shows that God knows everything. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. So that's a picture of him seeing everything that is taking place at that time. Verse 18, the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple, stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels were beside them, and they stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. This is the living creature I saw under 
the God of Israel, by the river Kibar, and I knew they were cherubim. Each one had four faces, each one had four wings, the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings, and the likeness of their faces was the same as the faces which I had seen by the river Kibar. Their appearance and their persons, they each went straight forward. God is going to leave. His glory is ready to depart on his cherubic chariots. Psalm 18, verse 10, says that he, God, rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. Cherubs are a picture of God's chariot. This is a picture of the glory. The glory of the Lord is moving. The glory of God moved from the threshold. The glory of the Lord is now at the eastern gate, the door of the eastern gate. God is ready to move, and what he's doing is he's taking his glory from his sanctuary. But he's doing so in stages. That gives us a picture of his tremendous reluctance to go. It's not like he just packed his bags, opened the door, and slammed it behind him and said, I'm out of here. It's a picture of somebody not wanting to go. It's a picture of somebody walking up to a door and standing there for a moment, wishing that somebody would say, I am so sorry, forgive me, remain. And then stepping a bit further, this hesitation because of love and concern. But nobody is saying, God, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. They're hardened in their idolatry. They've already said God has forsaken the land. The Lord doesn't see. What does it matter? And so what you see is God, the husband of Israel, as he's moving out, and he moves from one place, he moves to the second place. There's this reluctance on his part to move out completely, but he's going to have to do so. He has stated to this nation that if you do these things, I will forsake you. He said that early on in their history in Deuteronomy. In chapter 31, verses 16 through 18, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers. This people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land, where they go to be among them. And they will forsake me and break my covenant which I've made with them. Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day. I will forsake them. I will hide my face from them. They shall be devoured. Many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they have done in that they have turned to other gods. God said, If you won't have me, then I'm going to have to deal with you. And you see the Lord reluctantly moving out. His glory is about to depart. And we'll see that as it continues on next time we're together in chapter 11.